Well, I hope everyone got a chance to get a little break, a little cup of coffee or something. Um, and we're going to continue now with our, our second panel. Um, it's been very interesting this morning. And, then, and I, and I, uh, I think this next panel will uh, proceed in that, that same uh, interesting vein. I'm honored to chair this, this panel. Um, the panel has three very distinguished uh, lawyers who I think you'll be familiar with. Um, and what the three panelists are going to speak on is um, the development uh, and the interrelationship between uh, some of the instruments from the, from the, the sister organizations. Um, the first panelist is Angelo Faria, and he's going to speak on a topic I find extremely interesting, and that is the development of, um, from UNIDWA, the, the, the Hague Convention, uh, as it, it morphed into um, the CISG and the, and the work between, as, as it, it developed the two organizations. Um, Angelo, uh, as most of you know, is, is principal legal officer and head of the legislative branch uh, at, uh, at uh, UNSATRAL. And um, for um, uh, almost 10 years, he was the secretary general of, of, of UNIDWA. So his, his understanding uh, between the two organizations is, is, is quite extensive. And he's published um, numerous articles and books and, 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 uh, on legal harmonization and, uh, and the areas that he's going to be talking on. Our second speaker, uh, our second panelist is uh, Laura Dama. And Laura is going to discuss the, uh, the uh, interrelationship between the CISG and, and the unit law principles. Again, very important, very interesting topic. And uh, Laura is a um, professor at the Pontifical uh, Catholic University in Rio uh, in areas, uh, teaches private international law contracts. Uh, and he's participated uh, in uh, the working group on the principles, the unit law principles, uh, as well as the, the, the uh, uh, 2015 Hague principles. And uh, he's a member of the CISG Advisory Council, so he's worked very closely uh, with the CISG uh, for years. And our third um, panelist, again, very distinguished professor and lawyer, um, Hiro Sono. Uh, and he was going to discuss um, the, the, the uh, connections and interrelationships between um, instruments uh, from the various organizations dealing with um, uh, statute limitations, prescriptive periods, and, uh, and, and, and how this all works and how uh, they might interrelate. And Hiro, uh, as you may know, is a professor at Hokkaido University in Japan, um, uh, very distinguished uh, uh, international commercial law scholar, and um, one of the founding members of the CISG Advisory Council. Um, so again, a long, uh, distinguished um, uh, career and, and background with the CISG and these instruments. And with that, I would like uh, to uh, ask Angelo uh, to begin. I don't see, I don't see Angelo. Is he? There you are, Angelo. Your, your, your mic's on. Can we un unmute, Angelo? There we Am go. I unmuted now? You Thank are. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you very much, Maria Chiara, Ignacio, Anna, for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be back here and to address a topic that is very dear to me from this room, let me say, where it all began in a way, because since we're meeting, sitting here at the old reading, former reading room, still active reading room of the Unidraw Library at the Villa do Brandini in Rome. The unification of international sales law was one of the main items already in the very first work program of Unidraw. It was debated by the Unidraw Governing Council at second session in February 28 at the third session in, in, in December 28. And the work started on the base of a feasibility study uh, prepared by 
uh, no one less than Ernst Rabel, the famous Austrian-born German comparatist, was also a member of the governing council of, of Unidrop. The first draft of a uniform sales law was published by uh, Unidra in 1935 and was then submitted to the Council of the League of Nations, Unidra being at that time a specialized organ of the League of Nations. Uh, that work, of course, was interrupted with the out outbreak of World War II and was only to be resumed in January 51 at the initiative of the Dutch government, who then convened a diplomatic conference to consider the unification of uh, Sayers Law. Uh, the first draft coming out of that work in The Hague was uh, published in 1956. And at that time, also then UNIDRA had then revived the idea of developing as a parallel instrument on the formation of the contract of sales. The first draft on formation was presented in 1958, and eventually the two draft conventions went to the diplomatic conference convened by the Dutch government, a law on the contract of sales and a draft a uniform law on the formation of the contract of sales. They were both drafts, but in particular, ULIS, what became the law, uh, the uniform law, international sales, were uh, a true restatement of common elements of the various legal systems, and in particular common law and the various systems of the civil law tradition, but at the same time, they were already a significant effort to develop new solutions acceptable internationally where no common ground could be found. And this was possible because of the wise approach taken on the scope of the convention, some of the key issues. Um, and it is important to highlight them because you see many of those elements in the CISG and how they permeated the entire work that led to the adoption of the CISG. For example, as regards the scope, the Unidrag Governing Council had already decided early on that an instrument on sale of goods would have better chance of adoption if it was limited to international sale of goods. And in that, to consider not only as had been the originally the academic approach to define the sale of international sale of goods on the base of objective criteria, try to qualify what is in the nature of international sales, but to adopt the pragmatic criteria of the location of the party, the sub subjective element, which as you see eventually became the element for the uh, criteria for the application of the CISG. Um, the other important decision already taken at that time was to limit it to even though this is not stated so also in the CISG, to the sale of tangible corporeal goods. This was clear actually in the French uh, term, and there's also the, in the case of the CISG, the Spanish also authentic uh, reference to marchandises, mercancias, rather than the, the English goods, but it's clear that it was concerned with tangible, movable goods as the main uh, uh, element of international sales, but also the exclusion from that of many uh, particular goods that are subject to a particular regime under domestic law, stocks, negotiable instruments, but also uh, shipped and other uh, type of movable goods that have a special domestic treatment under a sales law. Another very important decision taken already at that time in the drafting of the what became ULIS was to avoid dealing with the relationship between the sales contract and property rights, especially the passage of title to the goods. As you know, there's significant difference under domestic law. And at that point of time, already UNIDRA realized that trying to harmonize the proper proprietary effects of the sales contract would be beyond the scope of the, of the project. And that rather than that, the instrument should focus on what is for practical means and purpose, the really important question it is the point or the passage of risks for loss of damage to the goods sold. And they are basically the, not exactly in the same way and not exactly the same structure, the basically the rule that was adopted. And Ulysses, this was the rule that was eventually then carried over, taken over by the CISG. Um, another example uh, was the formation of contract and the issue of revocability of an offer and also under what circumstances an offer can consider to be uh, uh, irrevocable and whether an, an offer, even if stated to be irrevocable, could be revoked. Also the question of revocability of an acceptance. And here again, trying to reconcile two diametrically different systems of contract formation. I'm talking about the uh, dispatch and the reception rules under civil law and 
and uh, the commotion uh, and, and common loss systems, how the EULIS uh, reached a compromise, which again would then be eventually taken over in, in its sense and essence by uh, the CISG. So the two uh, Hague uh, uniform laws were adopted at the Hague Conference in 1964. They were not, however, a success internationally. We know that very few countries ratified ULIS. Basically, it's Belgium, Gambia, Federal Republic, then Federal Republic of Germany, Israel, Italy, the Netherlands, San Marino, and, and the UK for ULIS, and the same countries, less Israel, for the second convention. So it was not surprising that for that reason, also a unification of sales law was then again the topic of the first uh, work program of UNCETRAL, UNCETRAL being established pursuant to the resolution of the General Assembly of 1966, started work in 1968. And one of the very first things that UNCETRAL does is then to send around the two uh, uh, conventions to governments around the world and ask for comments. And the result of that process was the conclusion that uh, it would be worthwhile to uh, attempt again to unify the law of international sales, not by uh, trying to promote ratification of either of the uh, Hague Convention, but by drafting a new instrument. And in doing so, UNCETRAL took the wise decision to base its work on the Hague Conventions. And that one can see still today in the text of, of, the, of what then became the CISG after a work within a UNCETRAL working group of about five years only, which is remarkable. Eventually then that uh, draft convention was adopted at the Diplomatic Vienna Conference in 1980 and entered into force in 1988. Uh, of course, that would not have been possible without uh, basing the work on ULIS, but of course, learning from the experience of, of ULIS, what could be done to improve the text and to make it more acceptable. Let's not forget that, uh, in 1970s, uh, in the United Nations, we had a much larger number of countries participating in the process, notably the United States, but not only the United States, all the developing countries that are members of the United Nations had not participated in the work that led to the adoption of uh, the two uh, Hague Conventions. But the um, CISG also um, tried to uh, resolve some of the uh, so to, to speak, defects of the two Hague Conventions that were criticized in some respects for being too academic and too doctrinal. So the CISG did a more radical work in terms of simplifying the remedy system under the under ULIS. It was still a little bit tributary to the old Roman law complex systems of different remedies for different types of breach and adopting the unitary, unitary notion of breach, which is a a fundamental component of the CISG and one element of the CISG that has uh, had a significant influence uh, worldwide in terms of law reform. Also, the avoiding this, the notion of ipso facto termination that exists in ULIS, that is circumstances that would lead automatically to the termination of the contract and insisting on the more pragmatic approach that termination by requires a notice by the party to the other, which is more practicable than having to rely on the existence of some automatic circumstances. There also the wise, wise decision to leave the validity of the sales contract for the applicable law, the principles of freedom of form and others are however, elements that are preserved from ULIS. Also, the uh, recognition of revocability of offers, the notion of anticipatory breach in case the other party risks to perform, the notion of fundamental breach that was already contained in, in ULIS, the right of full compensation for damages, uh, the party's obligations to, to mitigate their own damage. So several of these elements were preserved in CISG, and the wisdom of the CISG was really to only fix what one can consider to have been broke in, in, in all this, but not to go beyond what was uh, strictly necessary in terms of improving. Of course, there were changes in structure also uh, uh, resulted from the fact that the two conventions were unified in one. So a little more than five years took UNCETRAL to develop the CISG. And actually that gives me hope now that I am 57 to think that the project of this, of this size could have been completed in only five years. I've been in my professional life involved in the, in the harmonization of a commercial law for 26 years, but let's not forget those five years were the culmination of 
a long period, a gestation period that, that started long ago. So we're talking about a period of 51 years that would not have been completed with success at the United Nations had we did not have the solid groundwork done at UNIDRA for that purpose. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. I am one minute beyond the time, and I thank you for indulgence. Thank you very much. Angela, thank, thank you very much for that extremely interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, we, let's, let's hold off our questions and comments till uh, all three of our presenters have had a, a chance to speak. And with that, uh, Laura, would you like to uh, give your presentation? Thank you very much, Gabriel, for your kind uh, introduction and uh, thank you, Henry, for, uh, thank you, uh, Angelo, for your uh, speech. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, uh, most of all, uh, because I'm amongst uh, longtime friends. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will now talk to you about an interesting couple, the CSG and the UPIC. The CSG and the UPIC are quite different beings. While the UPIC only covers contracts for the international sale of goods, the UPIC reaches all kinds of contracts, be they sales, services, construction, or shareholders agreements. The CSG regulates only a few relevant aspects of international sales contracts, namely the formation and interpretation, obligations of the buyer and the seller, the passing of risk, breach, and remedies for breach. By contrast, the UPIC governs all general aspects of an international contract, including not only formation, interpretation, performance and non-performance, but also validity, illegality, authority of agents, content, third-party rights, set-off, plurality of obligors and obligees, and limitation periods. Last but not least, the CSG is hard law, hence binding law, while the UPIC is soft, non-binding law. They also have a big age gap. The CISG was born in 1980, while the UPIC is 14 years younger. As it happens with romantic couples, despite their differences, the UPIC and the CSG share a powerful goal, which is harmonizing contract law. They also rely on the same basic principles. The first one is freedom of contract. Next, both have an openness to usages. The CSG and the UPIC are also concerned with the conservation of contracts. And good faith is an integral part of both instruments. However, it, it remains controversial whether the CSG imposes on the parties a general duty of good faith. Finally, both provide against unfairness in international transactions. The sharing of basic principles has permitted the CISG and the UPIC to interact fruitfully over time. As in any other successful marriage or union, they have consistently cherished a, cherished a few goals. The first to have daily conversations, as shown by a growing body of case law referring to both instruments. Next, going a few days without needing each other, as they keep focused on their respective core businesses. Thirdly, they strive to become each other's best friend as demonstrated by the ANSI trials endorsement of the UPIC in 2012. 
they also try to keep that flame burning between themselves as in conciliating the UPIC's hardship with Article 79 CISG. Finally, they try to do something new once a month, such as the recent tripartite legal guide. To get closer and stronger, the CSG and the UPIC have developed their relationship in three main areas. Most often, it is the UPIC who fill the gaps in the CSG, something like a one-way interaction. While it may be frustrating to be putting in more effort than the other partner, it's always better to lead by example, as do the UPIC. The UPIC provisions can fill gaps in the CISG whenever the matter is covered but not expressly settled in the CISG, and the UPIC offers an adequate solution. CISG internal gaps, such as interest rates, hardship, exemption clauses, agreed sums, and set-off, may be supplemented by the UPIC provisions. A good example of this partnership is the 2009 judgment of the Belgium Court of Cassation available on Inelex. The UP can also supplement the CISG external gaps. For example, contract validity, agents, contracts in favor of third parties, and plurality of obligors and obligees, are matters excluded by the CSG, which, on the other hand, the UPIC address in detail. Supplementing the CSG with the UPIC provides an international and uniform framework and solution for CSG contracts, which is in line with Article 7, Paragraph 1 of the Convention. A good example of this interaction is the 2017 judgment by the Court of Appeal of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil that complemented the CSG with the UPIC rules on, on illegality. This judgment is also available at Unilex. There's a third scenario in which the CSG UPIC relationship shows its strength. In this context, the CSG may serve to fill gaps in the UPIC. Take the example of an international sales contract between a Bolivian seller and a Saudi Arabian buyer. Neither country is a CSG contracting state. The parties have stipulated that general principles of law shall govern their contract. A dispute arises and the parties submit it to arbitration in Paris. The arbitral tribunal establishes that the law governing the sales contract is the UPIC as a manifestation of general principles of law. While the UPIC is the governing law, it does not contain specific provisions on the conformity of goods. Thus, Articles 35 to 44 CISG may appropriately fill in the gaps of the applicable law. My esteemed colleagues, we know that the UPIC CSG relationship is not perfect. Renowned scholars have recently stated that the UPIC's rules on hardship are not fit to supplement the CISG. Like in any, any marriage or union, the UPIC and the CSG also have their ups and downs. But giving up is not an option. They have to make, work, to make it work together. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Laura, for that, that very interesting um, uh, analysis uh, of, of how these two instruments work together. 
uh, I think you correctly pointed out, it's, it's, a, it's a constant development on how that uh, this relationship works out. Uh, our third uh, presenter, uh, Hero, I invite you to start. Hey. Uh, thank you, Harry. Um, good morning and good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you, Harry, for um, your kind introduction. And I also thank the organizers of this conference for giving me this opportunity to meet friends whom I haven't uh, seen for a while due to COVID, and also to address the topic of limitation periods in international sales. What is a limitation period? Most restrictions have rules that provide certain time limits for bringing claims to courts or to arbitration. In civil law jurisdictions, they are called prescription periods. In common law jurisdictions, they are called statutes of limitation. Conceptually, they are different because prescription period is a substantive law rule that provides extinction of a claim by the lapse of time. While statute of limitation provides procedural bars to bringing claims to courts. Despite this difference, functionally, these rules are both time bars for the exercise of rights in legal proceedings and arbitral proceedings. The neutral term employed in international instruments for these rules is the limitation period. There are two international instruments on limitation period. They are the focus of my presentation. The first instrument is the 1974 Convention on the Limitation Period in the International Sale of Goods, or the Limitation Convention in short. The Limitation Convention is the very first uniform law convention that emanated from the work of Anstro. It deals with limitation periods for claims arising out of international sale of goods. When the Limitation Convention was adopted in New York in 1974, the CISG was still in its making, but the Limitation Convention was adopted with the view that it will work in conjunction with the CISG when the CISG is eventually adopted. And when the CISG was adopted in Vienna in 1980, a protocol to amend the 1974 Limitation Convention was also adopted. The purpose of the protocol was to align the scope of application of the two conventions. As a result, then the amended limitation convention and the CISG today have the same rule on scope of application. It is often said that the limitation convention and the CISG are sisters. The limitation convention being six years older than the CISG. However, unlike the CISG that has the genesis in Unidra's Hague Conventions, as Angelo has explained, the Limitation Convention was developed originally by Anstro. The Limitation Convention entered into force on the 1st of August 1988, which is seven months after the CISG. Currently, currently there are 30 contracting states to the Limitation Convention and among which 23 are parties to the amended convention. The second international instrument on limitation period is the Unidra principles. The 1994 edition of the Unidra principles uh, did not include principles on limitation periods. It first appeared in the 2004 edition and remains the same in the more recent 2010 and 2016 editions. The 1974 Limitation Convention thus is 30 years older than UPEC 2004 and then the principles of limitation period in the Unidra principles. And that is one generation apart and it shows in the different rules they employ and in the different role they play. First, let me explain the basic difference between the two instruments and, historical, and the historical roles they play. Of course, one is a hard law convention while the other is soft law. That, that is an aspect that I will not touch upon today. I will address the difference in the substantive aspect. The limitation convention adopts a limitation period of four years. The period commences on the date which the right accrues. In other words, when the right can be exercised. 
Note that the time of commencement is determined objectively, without any inquiry as to whether the party knew that he or she had the right. The reason that Anstrel took up limitation periods in international sales as their first product is due to its importance in international sale of goods. When the limitation convention was being prepared in the late 1960s and 1970s, domestic rules on limitation periods varied and the lengths of the period tended to be long. Among civil law uh, jurisdictions, the older codes adopted a limitation periods of 30 years following the law, Roman law tradition. Some newer codes of those days adopted a limitation period of 10 years. Moreover, there were different limitation periods for remedies for non-conformity of goods, ranging from six months to four years. The rules in these restrictions has changed now, but that was the situation, that diversity was a situation in 1970s. It was against that backdrop that the Limitation Convention adopted a single and significantly shorter four years limitation period. The reason for shortening the period was that 30 years was considered to be too long for international sale of goods, which required a speedier turnover. Thus, the adoption of a four-year limitation period in 1974 not only served as a unification or harmonization of law, but also served as a modernization of law. The situation was already different very different in 2004, 30 years after the Limitation Convention, when the UPIC adopted its principles on limitation periods. By the 1990s, there has been a major shift in domestic limitation period legislations. The lengths of period became considerably shorter. Notable examples are the Dutch Civil Code, which provides five years, and the new German Civil Code too, um, three years. Incidentally, the Japanese new civil code that we have from this year is also adopted three years period. These movements were reflected in the principles of European contract law, PECL, in 2002, and that has been an inspiration for the Unidrug principles. Unidrug principles reflects this modern trend. More concretely, the UPIC uh, adopted a limitation period of three years. It runs from the day after the day the of the G or creditor knows of or ought to know the facts that allow the creditor to exercise the right. The length of time is one year shorter than the limitation period, but what is more important is the time of the commencement of the four years, uh, of, the, of the three years period. It is determined subjectively rather than objectively. However, this may lead to a situation that the limitation period will never expire if the creditor never becomes aware of the facts giving rise to its rights. Thus, the intra principles provides another longer limitation period of 10 years, beginning on the day after the day the right can be exercised. This time of commencement is determined objectively. So to summarize, the intra principles adopts a dual, lim dual limitation period system with different time of commencement. There is a short three years limitation period running from the time the creditor is aware of his rights and a longer 10 years limit limitation period running from the time the right can be exercised. Whichever of the first expires first, the limitation period has expired. The principles approach of adopting a dual time of commencement consisting of a subjective time and an and objective time of commencement matches the global trend. This is different from the CISG's approach of adopting a single objective time of commencement. One might consider that the significance of the limitation convention has been curtailed because domestic legislations on limitation periods now adopt shorter limitation periods. One might also criticize that the limitation convention's rule on adopting a single objective time of commencement is outdated. With regard to the global trend to shorten the, the limitation period, that does not reduce the significance of the limitation convention. In my view, the adoption of short limitation periods in domestic laws means that more rights will be time barred 
by limitation periods. And the need for a uniform rule on limitation periods has become more significant now than in 1974. Um, limitation conventions different ap approach regarding the time of commencement is also justifiable given its scope. It is important to keep in mind that the limitation convention only applies to international sale of goods, while the, the unit of principles has a much wider scope of application. In international sales, sellers will be aware if the buyer does not pay. Buyers will be aware if the seller does not deliver. In these cases, both the objective and subjective time of commencement will coincide. It will make no difference. What is problematic is a situation where the seller delivered goods that are non-conforming. First of all, the limitation convention, like the CISG, does not apply to consumer contracts. It does not apply either to claims arising from physical harm. The rationale of a subjective time of commencement adopted by the Winter principles is to protect creditors who are not aware of his or her rights by delaying the running of the limitation period. This kind of protection may be needed for consumers or for victims who suffered physical harm. However, that is outside the scope of the limitation convention and also the CISG. Secondly, even if the buyer was not aware of the lack of conformity of the goods, the exercise of its rights to remedies will be barred not only by the limitation convention, but by substantive rules of sales imposing the buyer, imposing on the buyer a duty to examine the goods and to notify the seller of any nonconformity. Under Article 39, Paragraph 2 of CISG, the buyer must give notice of nonconformity to the seller at the latest within two years from the time the goods were handed over to the buyer. This rule already precludes the buyer who was not aware of the nonconformity from exercising its, right, its rights far before the expiration of the four years of limitation period under the limitation convention or the 10 years objective limitation period under the UPIC. One exception to this rule uh, is the case where the seller knew or could not have been unaware of the lack of conformity and if the seller did not disclose the lack of nonconformity to the buyer. In this situation, the buyer will not be subject to the two years cutoff period under Article 39, Paragraph 2, CISG. In this situation, the buyer will be time barred by the four years period under the limitation convention running from the time the goods were handed over to the buyer. This will be different under the usual principles where the limitation period will be 10 years from the handing over of the goods. This point, this last point may be the only contra reversal difference, the dual commencement system adopted by the UNDRA principles will make for the international sale of goods. However, it is interesting that it seems that these are not the typical cases where the limitation convention applies. A search of Anstrel's clout reveals that there are 24 cases that touches upon the limitation convention. Not all of them apply the limitation convention, but among those that, that do, only a few of them deal with a situation where the buyer is exercising its right because the delivered goods were non-conforming. The majority of cases are those where the sell seller is suing for payment of price after the expiration of the four years period. My final remarks is this. So overall, the location convention is appropriate in the overwhelming majority of cases. I have just cited from Spencer and Manor. And moreover, as indicated earlier, given the prevailing trend among domestic laws to adopt shorter limitation periods, the value of, limita uh, value of uniformity added by the limitation convention is larger than before. The limitation convention is still well and alive for international sales, and together with the more modern unitary principles, which applies to a wider type of transactions, forms a viable regime of limitation periods in international contracts. Thank you.
Hewitt, thank you very much for that, that very, very interesting um, uh, um, presentation on, on the limitation periods. Um, I, uh, unlike uh, most of the people listening, have had the advantage of reading all these papers in advance, and I've just been inundated with this, this a, a tremendous amount of very, very interesting, uh, and very thought-provoking um, uh, commentary. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank our, our, our three uh, uh, panelists, the excellent, excellent presentations. And with that, um, I'd open it up uh, for comments and, and questions. And um, I don't know if you can read the questions. I can, because we already have one for Angela, if, if you're uh, ready for this, Angela. And the question is, what are the most common sales or types of goods that represent the, uh, the most use of CISG provisions? So I understand the question correctly was what are the most common goods for which the CISG or is up to which the CISG is apply or to which the CISG would be useful? For those well, the most common sales or types of goods that represent the use of CISG provisions. So type, types of sales are the types of goods. Um, I don't have all the statistics in the on the the cloud database in in uh, in, in my in the top of my head, but uh, they tend to be manufactured goods. Most of them, the the largest amount of cases, also because a large amount of the uh, international trade in commodities is subject to special rules that choose. Uh, a domestic law, typically the law of the particular exchange uh, where those commodity transactions uh, take place. Cotton, grain, and crude oil typically are not covered by the CISG. The CISG, by, by and large, most cases involved, involve manufactured goods. That's, that's the, the, the bulk of what the case law on the CISG covers. And this as it does contain a, a large number of provisions that take that into account. Uh, provisions related, for instance, to the seller's obligation to deliver goods that are free of a third party's intellectual property rights. That typically uh, is a provision that is relevant for the sale of manufactured goods that would involve some sort of, a, for instance, a software, you think of uh, cars and other goods that have software built in that uh, would be subject to uh, to uh, intellectual property rights, or also, and this was one of the main reasons for the so-called uh, uh, buyers bias of this year. What some people perceive as a buyers bias of this ISG is the so-called the extended period for examination of goods that the buyer has before. Um, claiming lack of conformity of the goods. That is that 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 that, that provision concerning the re reasonable uh, time for denouncing lack of conformity. That was also taken into account the fact that some de developing countries may not be in a position to immediately unpack and test the goods and ascertain a lack of conformity. Uh, I wonder whether that is a satisfactory answer to the question that you asked me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very, very, very extensive uh, answer. Um, I, we have another question here, which I originally thought would be directed to Hero, and I think it is, but maybe the other two panelists might want to respond as well. And the question is, can the CISG and the 1974 Limitation Convention uh, be applied to digital assets? Uh, in other words, are digital assets to be considered goods under under these these conventions? Who are you directing that question to? <laughs> sort of all three. I, I we'll start with you. Do you have a response? I mean, this is this is a very timely question, obviously, because um, both uh, Unidwan and, and Unitrial are. are beginning work in, in broadly in the areas of digital assets. And, and one of the questions obviously is how that may uh, uh, work with these pre-existing uh, instruments. Uh, Henry, I'll just jump in very quickly to say, I know what, the, what Hero's answer to that question would be, and I agree with him, so you can pass the microphone straight on to him. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, and, 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 and Laura, are you going to agree as well? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, Hero, it's to you. All right. Um, I'm not sure if I have the right answer. Um, digital, well, it, I think it also depends upon what you mean by digital assets. Um, um, if, if you're talking about um, like bitcoins and those kind of assets, um, I think that is a topic that Unidroa and Anstro is going to be exploring uh, from now. And I think the uh, whether the CRST limitation convention applies to those uh, would also depend upon what outcome would come out from those uh, new developments. Um, but if if you mean software, for example, by digital assets, um, there are different views on on this. Um, um, my, my view is that. Well, it, it would be very easy under the Hague Convention, as Angelo has mentioned, that uh, it applied only to corporal uh, products, so um, software would not be um, a part of the Hague Conventions. But under the CRC, that part is uh, a little blurry. Whether it 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 class cla um, it uh, can be be classified as good or not. But another aspect that I think we have to be aware of is that software are not, in many cases, not sold. It's not a sale, it's a license, and it's a different type of transaction. And for that reason, I think uh, many software transactions will fall outside of the um, CISG and also the limitation convention. But there are different views, and uh, also case law also are split on this. Thank you, thank you. And if I can jump in on it, I agree with you as well. <laughs> it's, um, I have. A, 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 oh, here, here we go. Um, here's a question uh, to Laura. Uh, in general terms, how can the new legal guide help to improve the relationship between the two spouses? Can you can you please repeat the question, please? Uh, of course. How can the Okay, here's, here's the question. Uh, in general terms, how can the new legal guide help to improve the relationship between the two spouses? That, that's a very good question, thank you. Um, actually, uh, the, the legal guide's um, uh, purpose is to explain, to educate. And um, if it's... Um, maybe natural or obvious to some of us that uh, these instruments can um, interact uh, to the profit of, of international transactions. To most uh, users, to most lawyers dealing with international transactions, uh, it's not, it's not uh, th there's no roadmap guiding them through uh, these uh, instruments. As rightly pointed out by Neil um, uh, before us, um, there, there are several questions of, of choice of law that uh, have to be taken into, into account when uh, one, uh, let's say, uh, uh, decides to uh, uh, consider the application of the unit drop principles as, as the governing law of an international transaction. And uh, that's the kind of question that the uh, legal guide uh, attempts to, to answer and to clarify to users. So um, that, that's, uh, in short, uh, my answer is uh, the legal guide is, is another soft law uh, uh, instrument, so to say, uh, that um, would, would help uh, users not not accustomed to these instruments to find their way uh, through them. Thank you, thank you, Laura. And uh, and I uh, understand that uh, Angelo would like to um, uh, add some comments to this as well. Yes, um, thank you very much, Henry. Very briefly, I think the picture here is slightly more complicated. But in any case of the legal guide, we're talking not about the classical marriage, but it's actually a menage a trois, because we have three 
instruments that are working together. But if, let's say, if the legal guide were to play the role of the, um, the relationship counselor here, right, right? I think what this relationship counselor would be doing is would be to uh, try to uh, lower the mutual expectations of all the parties in this relationship so that they know what each of them can do to make the whole and this beautiful menage a trois continue working happily with the three of them, allowing uh, each of them enough freedom, but also enough boundage for the thing to not to, to uh, run astray. Very concretely, for instance, that uh, the rules on choice of law would also clarify and, ex and, and the explanation on how choice of law operates also explains to the user of the guide very clearly in which circumstances it, it's reasonable and safe for them to choose one or the other of these instruments to govern their transactions. What are the limits for that in each setting, for instance, before a national court, how far they can go, go how far they cannot go. The same thing as the relationship concretely between the unit raw principles and the CISG. How, how far can you safely use them in which setting? You know, uh, in arbitration, you have a much broader freedom to uh, supplement the CISG with the principles and all those things that the CISG doesn't deal with directly. However, before a domestic court, you have to do it through Article 7 of the CISG, that is a deprovision on the interpretation of the CISG and exactly what is an internal gap, what is an external gap of the CISG, and you have to respect that because that is hard law. And I think the legal guide does a very good job in explaining how the uh, CISG and unit drop principles work together, but also how the Hague principles support the application of those. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Angelo. And uh, I, I see uh, Eugenia Decoronia would like the, yes. to take the floor. Are you... uh, hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate all of the speakers about their excellent uh, speak speeches. Uh, I, I think that I will um, have the question for Professor Sono, mainly. Uh, do you think that this uh, double possibility, I mean, the three-year limitation subjectively and the 10-year objectively uh, provided in the UPICC, is it indicated for uh, in the realm of contracts? For example, we know this subjective and this difference in tort law, uh, but uh, usually in um, contract law, we have this objective. I don't speak about if it is three or four or five years, but uh, just uh, uh, a little bit puzzled whether it was indicated to have this double possibility, either subjective or in any case after that, uh, objectively after 10 years. Thank you. Yes, um, th thank, you. thank you for the question. Um, yes, the, if, um, the three, three years subjective commence time of, sorry, three years period commencing from a subjective time and uh, 10 years period commencing from a, an objective time. These rules in the inner principles is, is for um, contracts. They are designed for contracts. And it, it, they are designed for contracts. So yes, I, I think the answer is yes, uh, it, it works for contracts. But um, I also, um, see your point that um, it will be more um, important in tort cases that uh, these rules will, uh, these types of rule, rules will, um, will work. Um, that, that's because um, in tort law cases, the victim will not always know that he has a right, right against whom. And uh, the subjective period well, if you only have an objective period, uh, that might be um, a disadvantage for the uh, victim. Whereas in contract law cases, it is very, in most cases, the objective time and the subjective time will coincide. Because, but as I said, um, there might be, for example, in the cases of um, non-conforming goods, um, the objective time will be different from the subjective time um, 
if the seller, sorry, if the buyer does not discover that there is no conformity in the goods. So I, I, I think it still works in contract law cases. I, I'm not sure if I understood your um, question correctly, um, but th that, that, that is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Hiro. And are, are there any other uh, questions at, at this point? Did I, did, did, Ignacio, do I see you raising your hand? Oh, okay, please. This is actually a question. Uh, it, it rose from a previous question uh, of whether digital assets are goods in the sense of the convention. And um, um, of course, I'm absolutely no expert, but I was wondering, uh, what, what, the, the CISG would apply to um, goods that are um, uh, movable and tangible. Uh, and uh, although in our recent workshop, there was uh, a part of the experts that regarded digital assets, even cryptocurrencies, as actually um, tangible, not intangible, which was surprising to many of us, uh, wouldn't the exclusion come by way of analogy as to you know securities and, and basic and generally financial instruments so that wouldn't, they would not really be covered by the sale of goods because they're not goods this is my question to any of the experts that have spoken before any responses um Maybe because I'm a little bit old in this trade, I tend to be conservative and perhaps even slightly more conservative than, than Hero is. We know that um, it's generally assumed that the uh, scope of application of the CISG and the notion of goods in the CISG is likely to be broader than under, under OLIS, although some of the authentic language of the CISG suggests the contrary, notably, both French and Spanish that suggest tangible, movable goods. But that said, we also know there's been case law in several countries, uh, primarily in continental Europe and off continental Europe, mainly in Germany, that I've come to conclusion that, that at least off the shelf software might be covered by this JSG, but all those cases we had the caveat that the software in question was contained in the tangible medium, so that the person was actually acquiring a hard disk or a DVD or something that contained the software. And in that case law never addressed the relationship between the tangible medium and information contained in the tangible medium and intellectual property that, uh, to that information that is the software. Now we know that uh, DVDs and, and CDs have disappeared and uh, not even the laptops are made with a, with a reader for them and everything has been streamed and downloaded in purely intangible form. And this is why, as, as, as Hero said, partly this question becomes an outdated question because the contracts are all treated like a license. That's the way the, the, the manufacturers qualify and, 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 and structure the transaction as a license. You're basically paying a monthly fee for the right to use it. So there is actually no transmission of property or any obligation to transmit property to anything. Actually, that is excluded expressly from the contract. And it's very hard to see how this ISG could apply to a transaction that says this transaction is not subject to this ISG, apart from the fact that most of them would, for the abundance of doubt, also exclude expressly this ISG. But on the case of cryptocurrencies, because cryptocurrencies are the functional equivalent of something that is expressly excluded by the CISG, and that is money. And Article 2 uh, D of the CISG expressly excludes money from the CISG, but also excludes negotiable instruments, investment securities, shares, and stocks. So most of the things that are tokenized uh, are not things that are amenable for being covered by the CISG. Now, the interesting question is, when the token is a representation of an asset that is covered by the CISG, such as a bill of lading that is uh, covered by, uh, you know, a, a token. Now, as you know, the bill of lading itself will not be subject to the CISG, 
because it's a negotiable instrument. The goods may well be covered by this JSG. And the question is the extent to which uh, trading platforms will develop in the future where actually the physical possession of the goods will become irrelevant and the only thing that is being traded are, are the tokens. But as the CSG currently stands, uh, my personal reading is that it would not apply to any of those, not in the way the CSG is currently formulated. Thank you. Thank you, a Angelo. And uh, we're running out of time, but we have uh, a, one question that, that um, uh, I'd like to uh, give uh, uh, to the entire panel, because I, th I think it's an interesting question. And I, and I look forward to what you, uh, uh, your answers. Um, the question is, it's, it's common for parties to uh, choose the law governing contract by choice of law uh, provisions, but to what extent can one choose um, the property law to govern their agreement? Or, May I, uh, oh, please, please. In, in most contracts, from my um, experience, um, uh, seeing a lot of um, uh, contracts that um, that uh, provide for ICC arbitration and etc. Uh, in most contracts, uh, the 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 law uh, chosen by the parties first is a national law, domestic law, and secondly deals only with uh, the the contractual. Uh, uh, duties and obligations of the parties, rights and obligations of the parties. Um, it, it, I have never seen uh, this kind of uh, dépassage, so to say, in which the parties would choose a different law governing um, ownership of, of um, certain uh, goods. I, I can, I could consider the parties uh, choosing a, a given a certain law, domestic or otherwise, to govern uh, the, 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 the ownership of uh, movable goods. But I, I, I would see it um, um, uh, difficultly to, uh, for them to choose uh, a law for, for, for governing uh, immovable goods because uh, usually they they are uh, mandatory uh, in the sense that uh, th they are mandatorily applicable in the sense that uh, the goods or the immovable goods seated uh, in the territory of a given country are necessarily governed by that country's law and uh, are not subject to, to party autonomy. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I have a couple of questions, but I will ask them to our uh, uh, panelists uh, uh, privately because we are out of time. Uh, but I wanna thank the three panelists for this extremely interesting uh, and informative uh, panel. And uh, normally I'd ask for applause, but it's kind of hard to do on Zoom. So again, thank you, and, and with that, um, we'll end the panel.